Good afternoon and welcome to a virtual tour of the Leslie P. and George H. Hume Furniture Study. I'm Patricia Kane, the Friends of American Arts Curator of American Decorative Arts here at the Art Gallery. We have an unusual program for you today that features the exhibition Furniture at the Yale Center for British Art, a selection. And Rachel Hellerick, Senior Museum Preparator at the Center, who organized the show, will lead us through the exhibition uh, today. This exhibition will be on view until March 27th. And as uh, Rachel talks about the objects in the show, I will offer comparisons of objects here in the furniture study uh, that provide parallels, um, if you will, uh, between the show and in some cases, historical furniture. If you have questions as the program progresses, please enter those into the Q&A and we will address them at the end of the program. So Rachel, it's going to be very exciting to see this um, exhibition of yours. So please uh, tell us about it. Thank you, Pat. Um, good afternoon. My name is Rachel Hellerick, Senior Museum Preparator at the Center and Curator of the current show, Furniture at the Yale Center for British Art, a selection. The idea of displaying the center's original furniture came about during the early months of the pandemic as a way to have an exhibition that was viewable from the outside so visitors would not have to enter the building. After working at the center for the past 16 years, admiring the museum furniture, I thought this would be its long awaited chance to be showcased. It's new territory for the center to have a furniture display and for this space in the lecture hall lobby to be used for an exhibition. The indoor outdoor nature of the lobby limits what can be shown. Fortunately, the idea was welcomed with enthusiasm by director Courtney Martin. When the exhibition was up and running, I naturally looked forward to the opportunity to give a tour to Patricia Kane and was delighted she was able to visit the interior of the show, albeit with the challenges of COVID restrictions. It's great to be reunited here today for our virtual tour with comparisons Patricia has put together from the Hume Furniture Study at the Yale Art Gallery. These objects were selected by architect and interior designer Benjamin Baldwin, who previously collaborated with Louis Icahn at Exeter Library in New Hampshire. Baldwin was known for his simple yet atmospheric interiors, which drew from a variety of sources. He, like Khan, focused on raw materials, the importance of natural light, and bringing the outside in. Garden design was for Baldwin addressed as crucially as a space within. It was a pleasure to research his life. He lived and collaborated in this golden era of design with figures like Alil and Aero Saarinen, Charles Eames, and Juan Moreau, among others. Baldwin was officially brought on after Kahn's untimely death in 1974 by succeeding architects Anthony Pelleccia and Marshall Myers. The green sofa bed by CI Designs is immediately seen in the foreground. Additional views of the exhibition featuring an orange upholstered straight line lounge chair by designer Ward Bennett, two oak planters with artificial ficus trees and a low round table, both by Pelleccia and Myers a semicircle arrangement of modular seating by Don Chadwick, and far up in the distance is a Windsor style chair by Claude Bunyard called the CB10 chair. I should note that before the room came together, it was part of my plan to have photographer Richard Caspel photograph the furniture in the studio. Knowing the website would be a huge component of the show, I wanted visitors to be able to look at these objects on their own in high resolution. Instead of the studio, Richard offered to shoot them in either the entrance court or the stairwell, and I thought the stairwell would be perfect. The curve of the concrete wall and travertine floors really lent itself to the nature of these objects. Most of these Windsor style chairs constructed in ash still grace the interior of the center to this day. Both the CB10 and the armless version called the CB12 can be found in the center's libraries, offices, and other common areas. Khan also chose these for Exeter Library. 
Baldwin, knowing this, decides to use them again as they would have likely have been chosen by Khan. Windsor chairs originated in England and are by design a very durable construction and have been in production since the 18th century. Here in the center's reference library are the CB10 chairs paired with trestle tables as they are at Exeter. The CB10 and 12s are the most common form of seating at the center next to the Chadwick modular seating. You can also see the orange Bennett lounge chairs in a group in the back. And here is your comparison with the Bowback Windsor armchair, Pat. Yes, indeed. Uh, this Bowback uh, is um, by Ebenezer Tracy, who was a Windsor chairmaker who worked in Lebanon, Connecticut. Um, and uh, the form is called a continuous Bowback because, as you can see on both of these chairs, um, the arms of the chairs and the um, top crest rail are uh, one continuous bent piece of wood. Uh, it's a real tour de force of uh, Windsor chair making um, to have such an extreme uh, use of um, the strength of either oak or ash and the Ch Windsor chair makers ability to uh, shape it with steam and heat. Although these two chairs share a lot of um, similarities in their overall form, um, there is one very striking dis dis difference between them. And that is that the um, Tracy chair is dark. In fact, it's black. And the uh, CB10 chair is um, in the natural wood with um, simply a, a resin uh, coating. Um, now the 18th century Windsors um, uh, typically were painted because the chairs are not made of a single wood. The Windsor chair makers chose different woods that had to serve different functions in the construction of the chair. The uh, bow and the spindles, for instance, are typically ash or oak woods that are very strong and as I said earlier lend themselves to bending by heat or steam. The seats uh, are typically a soft wood like uh, pine or uh, yellow poplar that can easily be shaped with draw knives and spoke shaves. And then the legs um, typically are maple or some similar fine grain wood that lends itself to having very crisp outlines when it's turned on a lathe. Um, and so to mask all those different grains, if you will, the Windsors uh, in the 18th century typically were painted. There's one difference between, uh, another difference, I should say, between the Tracy Windsor and the CB10, and that is that the seat on the Tracy is one slab of wood while the CB10 is made up of multiple boards, which um, is, of a typical of this Windsor form that continues, as Rachel said, into the 19th and then into the 20th century. Great. One of the most unique pieces to the center is this sofa bed by CI Designs. It is somewhat characteristic of similar day beds that were in production during the 1960s through the 70s though rail and spindle construction are often seen in America's CT designs long predating this sofa bed. While there is no specific date attached to this work and CI Designs is no longer in business, it is found on Baldwin's furniture list from 1975. Like the CB10 chair, the sofa bed is constructed of ash, which adds to its durability and its ability to withstand 45 years of public use. It also felt harmonious to present this sofa bed and the CB10 for their rail design. And here's your Windsor settee, Pat. Yes, um, in fact, when I looked at the sofa bed in the show, um, again, because of the spindles used across the back and supporting the arms, uh, I immediately thought of our Windsor uh, settees. And here we have uh, a rod back uh, example in the furniture study. Um, uh, so the sofa bed and the settee share that, that feature. Um, they also are supported on turned legs um, on the settee. 
Uh, these are simpler than the legs on the uh, Tracy Windsor we just looked at because they're in the so-called bamboo style. Uh, what's different about the construction here is that the settee, of course, continues the uh, Windsor tradition of the slab seat while the sofa bed uh, uses rails. And um, the sofa bed, of course, has wonderful upholstery, which makes it very comfortable, um, which the settee um, does not. But uh, we know that Windsor chair seats um, and even on settees were um, sometimes upholstered, not uh, always, but that was an option. Windsor chair makers um, uh, produced, or they could have simply been used with cushions uh, to make them um, somewhat um, more uh, comfortable for sitting. Wonderful. One of a series of oak tables with laminate tops often used in the center's offices and staff lounge. The gray laminate surfaces echo the raw materials in the museum's architecture like steel and concrete. Pletchia and Myers designed several pieces of oak furniture that have been in use since the late 1970s. In addition to the tables, there are oak benches that are often situated in the center's entrance court. You can see here an architectural drawing by Pletchia and Myers of the laminate tables. Ours is sort of in the center, kind of lower. And you can see the different sizes of the circular versions that we have and the square, the low tables and the oak benches on the lower right. And here's your stickly table, I think predating our table by about 70 years, would you say? Uh, definitely 70 years, yes. But um, these two tables share have a lot in common. Uh, in fact, when I saw uh, this occasional table in the um, center's exhibit, I immediately thought, about our uh, stickly uh, table, which probably functioned as a tea table. Of course, the heights of these tables are, are very different. Um, um, the occasional table is uh, at the center is uh, low, um, conforming to being reachable from um, sitting in um, uh, uh, the Chadwick furniture. Uh, and the, the uh, Stickly table is uh, a lot taller, but if you look underneath the top of both of those tables, you will see a, a similar uh, bracing feature, and that is uh, a, a cross brace uh, that helps attach the tops of the table, but also uh, stabilizes them. And the um, stickly table uh, also, of course, has stretchers down below. Um, and the stickly table is made of oak in um, what we often refer to as the arts and crafts period. Oak became the preferred wood for um, domestic um, furniture. Uh, it's one of the periods in American design when oak uh, really uh, comes into fashion. Uh, we find it again uh, in, in part in the revival, the Gothic revival style of the 19th century. You will find uh, American furniture once more made of oak. And um, momentarily, we will see the earliest use of oak furniture in America. But clearly, oak was a wood of choice for uh, Louis Kahn and uh, is used extensively in. Um, not only the, um, the buildings, but uh, the furniture uh, in those buildings. Also designed by the architectural firm, these planters existed in the entrance court for over 20 years. Though originally the plants were real, they were very much like the artificial ficus trees featured in the exhibition. The planters are constricted of rift sawn white oak with copper flashing and fiberglass interiors. The rift sawn style in which the planters were constructed relate to the rest of the millwork and the paneling in the museum. Rachel Bunny Mellon, Paul Mellon's wife, had a background in horticulture and played a role in deciding what to plant. Here's an image from the early days where you can see the planters and different types of plants thriving in the natural light of the entrance court. 
the Barbara Hepworth sculptures appear to seamlessly exist among the trees. A lot of my research involved looking at the past, what was done, and how I wanted to recreate it. Here are more images featuring the planters and how much they contributed to the overall atmosphere of the museum. The color photograph on the left from 1986 reveals how the design of the planters relate to the oak paneling in the entrance court. The photo of the long gallery on the right shows just how much the galleries were decorated with plants. And here's a comparison with your chest. Yes, this is, um, here we are again in the furniture study with this chest um, that was made in uh, New Haven County, um, perhaps out towards the Guilford area, um, probably about um, 1670 or, or thereabouts. And I think the, the planter and the chest um, share a lot in common. Um, they're both sort of very four square. They look uh, very strong and very rugged, uh, and indeed they are. Um, and they uh, also seem to hug the ground um, with these uh, rectangular uh, legs. Uh, there are some uh, definite differences um, between these two objects, um, and that is the chest is made up of panels held within these upright and uh, horizontal uh, framing elements, if you will. And it's often referred to as joined construction. Uh, the the uh, craftsmen who made this furniture um, typically called themselves joiners. And so those panels um, uh, sit in grooves cut in the horizontals and the uprights. And those horizontals and uprights are pinned together with pegs. Uh, that's not what we have on the, um, the 20th century planter in the center. Although we have uh, the uprights, um, the side panels are not uh, set within, within frames. Uh, but we could have the next uh, slide, Rachel. I think what's so interesting about um, the, uh, the oak used in the uh, center's uh, wood paneling and furniture and uh, the oak that we find in the 17th century uh, chest is that uh, it's fabricated in, what, in a way that's really, that they're closely related. Um, the oak in the planter is uh, riff sawn. Um, and uh, the oak in the chest is actually riven. Uh, and both those techniques of sawing or preparing the wood um, are using um, the, the, the quarter grain or close, the riff sawing is not quarter grain, but it is close to, so you get this very straight uh, striation uh, across the surface of the board. And in the planter, you will see these little sort of dark lines. And those are actually the rays that are part of the uh, of structure of, of the oak. And in the joined chest, um, because it's the way its wood is fabricated, uh, you're truly in the quarter. Those rays are opened up so they appear like these little flecks, these little light areas across the surface of the wood. Could we have the next slide, Rachel? So uh, the, I'm showing you here some very common oak flooring that uh, one probably encounters in many uh, buildings one's in. And in this image, you will see on the right that the oak uh, tends to have very straight grain. On the right, what we're looking at are those great loopy lines, which is um, where the uh, sawing of this wood has cut through the annular rings. And this is what you never see in the wood in the center because it is riff sawn. Um, the uh, slide on the left uh, is one of the instructional panels we have in the furniture study. And uh, here it's, it's showing how the oak in the chest was actually riven. That is, it was split from a large oak log using a tool called a fro. That's that L-shaped um, uh, tool there with the big iron blade. 
which is struck with a big mallet or beetle. And uh, below the blade of the fro, you see um, a contemporary woodworker uh, cutting a panel like the panels on the chest. And, um, and because it is truly quarter, uh, working with the quarter sawn or the radial um, section of the wood, you get, uh, again, this difference in appearance, which we're going to look at once more in the next slide. So um, uh, here again, you see what that riving achieves on the, um, the detail of the chest is the medullary rays really in evidence. Um, but even on the planter, because it is this rift sawn wood, which as Rachel can explain to you is, is much more expensive uh, to cut up a log this way, correct, Rachel? It is, it is expensive and there's a little bit more waste involved because like the quarter saw, it's very similar in that way, but they're cutting perpendicular to the rings of the tree. So it's, you can't really use every piece. It won't give you that nice, those nice straight grains that are so characteristic of riff sawn. And it also adds to so much strength as well. We should also say that, that it's one of the strongest ways to cut wood, right? Right, absolutely. The wood that is plain sawn, that is the great loopy uh, cutting through of the annular rings is a lot less stable than wood that's either quarter sawn, either sawn or riven, or uh, certainly the rift sawn is the, um, the, the most stable of all the cuts that uh, you can um, uh, used to fabricate wood or from a log. Right. Now for a total change of pace, uh, we have Don Chadwick's modular seating, and it's been the center's premier choice of gallery seating since Baldwin chose them over 40 years ago. They normally exist in the galleries in a back-to-back -back orientation, giving the visitor optimal perspectives while viewing works of art. The museum has both the straight module and the 30 degree inside module as seen here to make that curve. All the modular seating was replaced in 2016 during the center's building refurbishment with the updated models that bore a higher seat and had the ability to hold electric power. The new seating was upholstered in fabric by Kavrat Maharam and as close to the original colors based on what Herman Miller had for color options in 2015. The image to the left was the inspiration for the semicircle arrangement in the exhibition. This grouping might have been just an experiment, but I thought it would be interesting to recreate. The Herman Miller tear sheet on the right from 1974 was from our institutional archives. You can see here the different style versions and how they could be arranged. And here is your comparison with the modular seating. Luckily, you have a straight module version and an original one at that. So we can see how different they are, but yet, you know, how similar. Yes, the, um, the original furniture um, was retired um, when uh, the, the Khan building was restored um, in 2015. And uh, we became aware that uh, some of that original furniture was being stored out at Yale West Campus, which of course is where the furniture study is now. So um, we were very um, grateful when uh, Amy Mars, the former director of the center, uh, told John Gordon, my fellow curator, and I that we could uh, look at the uh, furniture in storage and uh, see if there was a Chadwick chair we wanted for the collection. So we went and pawed through the, the uh, available um, examples and found this one, which was in remarkably good condition. And, uh, and we were able to accession it for the permanent um, collection. Uh, and I love the fact that it is in this sort of um, chestnut brown, if you will, uh, fabric, which uh, seems uh, really that color evokes to me the 1970s when earth tones were so much in fashion. And it's great to have been able to uh, capture um, uh, this example uh, for the permanent collection that does just that. And your reception chair. 
Yeah, so as I walked around the furniture study, um, uh, thinking about the Chadwick chair and whether there were any uh, sort of precedents to this form in the collection, um, uh, going down the aisle of seating furniture, I was really struck by uh, this reception chair uh, that's attributed to the Herder Brothers firm that was the premier uh, maker of um, furniture and interior woodwork uh, in New York City in the late 19th century. And um, this example was um, uh, probably in the mansion that Mark Hopkins built in San Francisco uh, in the 1870s. Uh, and although, you know, you could look at these and say, well, you know, they seem, they, they seem very different. They are. Uh, one, the herder chair is made of rosewood. There's no wood sort of uh, being displayed or clearly visible in the Chadwick chair. It is upholstered in silk uh, as opposed to some sort of velour. And it's got lots of little tassels and um, fringes um, hanging from it. But nonetheless, if you think about um, it and how it functioned in a room as a chair that a person could lounge on during a reception, uh, its seat is very low to the ground. Uh, it slants uh, backwards slightly. And certainly the back is upholstered as the Chadwood chair back is, and it definitely slants backward. So this idea of a chair that's low to the ground that you could lounge in um, certainly goes back at least to the uh, 19th century in American furniture design. And we have one more example here of the Gary lounge chair, I'm sorry, the Gary Easy Edges line. Yeah, so here's the little grouping, the Herder Brothers chair in the back there, uh, the Chadwick chair uh, on the left, and um, actually, and the Gary chair on the right. And the Gary chair and the uh, Chadwick chair actually um, live in a bay together in the uh, furniture study. Uh, I think uh, we placed them there because the, uh, the colors sort of, you know, they seem very compatible. Um, the Gary chair is actually made of cardboard. Um, and but I never really, it never, I never really focused on visually how much they are alike until I had to think about um, the Chadwick chair and, and comparable material in the furniture study. And I was just struck by the fact that uh, here we have seats that are rounded in the front and slope to the back. And uh, then we have back panels that slope backwards. And in between that back panel and the seat, there is a sort of circular or cylindrical opening. Uh, in the Gary chair, it is absolutely open, but the curves of the ends of that cardboard on that chair are very evocative of the cylinder shape you have on the uh, Chadwick chair. And so it really made me wonder since the Gary design um, precedes the uh, Chadwick design by a few years, uh, whether, um, you know, Chadwick was actually uh, looking at the Gary chair. It could be. Yeah, so it's very similar. And finally, we have um, the lounge chair straight line by Ward Bennett, also keeping with that 1970s palette, you know, that, that orange really speaks in that same language as the tan Chadwick's. Um, and we had many of these lounge chairs, we still do from this series, and they were upholstered in a variety of different color fabrics made by Boris Kroll. In the mid 1960s through the mid 1980s, Bennett was the sole designer for Brickell Associates in New York. Baldwin even had furniture by Bennett in his New York apartment when he first started designing for Brickell. Bennett designed many different forms of seating during this time, including the brown leather tufted sofas in, the, uh, in our library court upstairs. Geiger Furniture acquired Brickle Associates in 1993 and still produces a select group of furniture by Bennett like his sled chair and I-beam table that celebrates his use of industrial materials. And the easy chair is a great new segue into this comparison. So 
Um, so we don't have anything in the furniture study that's exactly like the Ward Bennett chair. We do have, uh, we actually have some uh, sort of Berger chairs by Ward Bennett. We also have flatware by him in the collection. So I was a little hard pressed to, um, uh, you know, draw a direct comparison. But then I said, you know, uh, what we're dealing with here is the tradition of uh, a, an upholstered chair um, that whose upholstery offers comfort. And uh, in American furniture, um, this tradition um, begins with the easy chair that um, uh, is made from the early years of the 18th century. Uh, and here I've uh, pulled out a late 18th century example, but you can see in the lineup uh, to the right of it that we're uh, going back in history and we have quite a few uh, similar chairs like it. Uh, unlike the Ward Bennett chair, its uh, legs uh, are exposed, its back is very high, and it also has these um, wings, if you will, at right angles to the back. But let's look at a moment for a moment at who this type of chair was really designed for. <laughs> yeah, and it, uh, the easy chairs in the 18th century uh, were typically made for people who were elderly and frail, like Anna Powell, who is sitting in this easy chair to have her portrait painted by John Singleton Copley in the mid 18th century. And you see that this um, tiny little woman um, is completely enveloped by the tall back and the wings. So she or someone who is an invalid uh, sitting in a chair like this would have been protected from cold drafts. Uh, they would have had nice soft surfaces to rest their head against and lounge their body. Chairs like this um, were often fitted with commodes under their cushions. Uh, the one in the aisle of the furniture study has a tight seat, but most of them uh, in the row have cushions and those often hid a panel that uh, held a, a commode. And if we could just go back, Rachel, for a minute to the previous two slides. So once again, um, looking at the two ch chairs, um, the Ward Bennett chair does not have a high back. And that's because, you know, in the late 19th century, when central heating comes in, uh, our environments don't have the same kind of challenges that they did in the 18th century. Um, and um, so the issue of, of protecting someone who's in this chair has sort of vanished. Now, by the late 19th century, that uh, when upholstery, the upholstery trade is really developed quite extensively, you will find um, chairs that have completely upholstered sides, upholstered down to the floor, like this one. Um, but um, basically, it is a form that is unknown in the 18th century, but comes in in the 19th century. And this example, with its very um, rectilinear design um, sort of very much speaks to the modern era. Yes. And the Bertoli chair of fiberglass and polyester, I believe. Yeah, so um, this is sort of, you know, a kind of um, not a direct comparison, but I like this comparison. Um, Carlo Bartoli was um, a Milan architect an industrial designer who designed quite a bit of furniture. And uh, in the 60s, um, he and many other Italian designers were experimenting with new materials, resins, plastic, uh, for the fabrication of furniture. In fact, um, they were leading the world in um, a, a contemporary domestic uh, design. Um, that fact was acknowledged by a wonderful exhibition that MoMA put on in 1972 um, called Italy, the New Domestic Landscape. So uh, this chair um, achieves some of the things that the Ward Bennett chair achieves, 
uh, only doing it with uh, the polyester uh, reinforced with fiberglass that enables the interior surfaces of that chair to be molded. So they're very ergonomic. Um, you're, it's, it's not a hard, sur it is a hard surface, but it's got, it's got curves that conform to your body. I think the other thing about this material is that it is uh, so strong uh, that Bartoli is able to uh, cut out these large arcs um, that form the legs um, in the front, back, and sides. Um, and doing that also makes this chair very, very light. So I can move this chair around um, by myself um, because it's, um, it is so lightweight, whereas I'm sure the word Bennett chairs uh, are not so easily um, moved around. I don't think I could move it all by myself. No, it takes two people, definitely. In closing, I want to share this evening's slide of the exhibition because I think it just adds a liveliness to the lower court as people dine at Harvest Restaurant. I think Baldwin would have welcomed the idea of his furniture selection displayed in the space for its proximity to the courtyard, bringing the outside in. As well, the location and use of the lobby appeals to Khan's background in urban planning and his desire to connect the museum with commercial spaces. I really compliment you, Rachel, for this exhibition. Uh, I have uh, certainly enjoyed um, uh, looking down into that, that courtyard. And it really has enlivened the space, both in the daytime, you can easily see the furniture from the street. And uh, in the evening, uh, it really uh, makes the space uh, have this magical uh, glow to it. Um, so I think it's, I think it's been a real success. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me today. And those wonderful comparisons that you made from the Hume Furniture Study, I think it's just great. So um, now we're going to turn to uh, q and I hope you've been um, putting uh, questions into uh, the queue. Um, but I have a couple of questions, Rachel, that um, I'd like to um, um, uh, um, have you respond to, if you would. Um, I thought it was wonderful that you had materials from the center's archive, like the tear sheet for the Chadwick furniture and the design drawing. But um, with the furniture, I, do you have things like uh, fabric swatches and um, that kind of information in, in the archives? We do. Luckily, they did save small swatches. So for almost, I think all of these, we had a swatch for the green sofa bed, which is actually called hunter green, even though it's not a real hunter green, but it's it's the name of the fabric or the name of the color rather in Ward Bennett's and the variety of different colors we had for those chairs. I think there were at least three or four different. We had the um, deep green olive color. And I think another like peach, a soft peach color. Um, but yes, we did. They, they kept a, a large number of things I was able to look back on and find and had all the right information. It's just a shame that some of these, you know, companies don't exist anymore. So, you know, tracking things down completely, that was tough, you know, especially with CI designs no longer in business um, and other places. But yeah, we do have quite a bit of information and now more to add to it. Uh, it's really interesting that um, how taste and color is also uh, is such a generational thing. Um, and so uh, I think the uh, kind of earth colors that um, at least in the Chadwick, the art gallery now has in its collection, um, um, I would imagine uh, that colorway is really not available um, at present. Yeah. they. They redid them in 2016 with, I mean, the, the tan is close, but I don't think the tan perfectly was completely a match, but it's as close as they can get. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't looked at them side by side, mm -hmm. but I'm sure, you know, it's as much as we can get to the 1970s palette as well with the navy blue color. Right. And so um, uh, I know that uh, 
the Yale Center for British Art has um, really um, been exemplary in uh, archiving um, uh, papers uh, related to the building, the development of the building, the conservation of the building. Um, do you think there are any plans to archive some of this furniture so there, um, in the future there could be examples that uh, were not um, used to death um, and that do um, save um, some of these um, designs from the 1970s? Yes, I think that it would be great to preserve them in some way. And as you know, we have West Campus that in the art gallery also shares. So there is more space there to sort of accession these objects, but I would like to find some way to preserve them, especially, you know, the green sofa bed because it won't exist again. And the Ward Bennett, we don't have many of the orange upholstery anymore. So I feel like those especially need to be preserved. So I'm looking into ways to do that. Uh, so one of the participants adds, asks, um, did you say that Brickle designed the leather sofas in the library court? I did, yes. I mean, Ward Bennett designed them for Brickle, but he was the only designer for Brickle, so yes. Right, he was um, Brickle's designer at that right. point in time. Right. Um, and another uh, attendee asks, um, are there examples of British furniture uh, at the center? That's a good question because all of these designers are technically American, but uh, Claude Bonyard was born in Britain. So he originated in Britain, but he came to the US and designed here as well. So he would be the only one that's linked to the UK. Um, someone else has asked, um, uh, do you feel there is currently a contemporary style uh, or will it take time for it to emerge? I think it will take time to emerge, but I think that um, there's a place for it, perhaps. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, this furniture has stood the test of time for so long. So I could see the center using them as long as we can. Um, they're part of the original you know, selection for the building. And I think in keeping with that, we'll continue to use what we have. And uh, someone else has uh, directed um, a question to me about the stickly table. Um, uh, they asked, did the stickly table have a pierced top? Um, that is, did the legs project um, through the top? Um, and uh, they do not on the stickly table. Is that how they work on the, um, the occasional table in the, in the center? Do those legs pierce through the top? Uh, they do somewhat, yes, but they're, they're sort of finished, but you can see where they rise up slightly. Yes. Um, so here's a question. If you could reimagine the library court's furniture, uh, how would you do it? The library court where the brown leather tufted sofas are? Um, hmm. I haven't <laughs> thought about that too much. I mean, it's been this way since the beginning. Um, I did think if, well, I don't, it's, it's a tough question. I can't see them moving, <laughs> to be honest. They just kind of belong there. Now, I, I think that the, um, the center really um, has tried so hard to um, maintain the original um, vision of the, of the building. And um, uh, it would be, of course, you know, every generation there's new thinking. Um, but I would say at the current time, um, with the certainly with the renovation of the building and the um, um, the recent renovation of the building, such 
um, pains were taken to really um, find comparable carpet and um, you've talked a great deal about the furniture designs and um, the reissue of Herman Miller for the Chadwick. Uh, right. I, I can't imagine um, it being rethought, but um, you know, time will tell. I mean, time will I, tell. Yep. I mean, as, as far as museums go, we still have a kind of young history, 45 years, so we shall see. Indeed. Yeah. Well, Rachel, I really have enjoyed um, um, talking with you about this furniture and um, gives me a new appreciation of the um, interiors of the Khan building, um, new appreciation of the, the rifts on wood in that building, which, um, you know, I guess subliminally I knew it was there, but um, just uh, talking about it with you um, really just uh, made me aware of uh, how much thought went into um, those interiors. Likewise, and seeing the furniture study, that lovely tour you gave to me, and I'm sure um, some people might be curious if they could visit the furniture study. Are you open to visitors yet? Uh, we are open to visitors um, by appointment now. Um, and um, we are hoping that in the months ahead, if um, the um, situation with COVID um, uh, re remains uh, pretty stable as it is right now, that we once more may begin to offer um, a regularly scheduled uh, public tour. Uh, when we first opened, we offered uh, a tour every uh, Friday at uh, about this at 1230. Um, and uh, hopefully um, in the near future, we'll begin easing back into that schedule. Great. Look forward to that. Any more questions? I don't think so. No. I think, uh, we have um, come to the end of our questions. And um, I think um, that um, our program is completed. And I thank you again for um, giving us this uh, opportunity to have a slightly different look at the Hume Center and how it functions. And also to have this, this um, ability to see this, your exhibition through your eyes as the organizer. Thank you. I look forward to our next collaboration. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you all.